May I invite us to open our Bibles to the 12th chapter of the Gospel according to Mark. Mark's Gospel, chapter 12. We're going to look at, in a moment, verses 28 through 34, which is a unit of thought, paragraph, if you will, of thought, that I believe God can use in our lives as he would have us to be salt and light in the world in which we're living in. While you're turning there, let me say a few words in relationship to some issues that I believe would be pertinent to introduce this text. A number of years ago, we had a pastor in this city that uh, would otherwise be considered a conservative, theologically sound pastor. His position was that... uh, if you wore, that was back in the years, the days that the horn rim glasses were out, the metal frame glasses were in, and he told all of those that were working around him and with him and those in his congregation that if you wear the metal frame glasses, that's indicative of uh, uh, liberalism, and therefore you're sinning against God. His position was that uh, for the ladies, you've got to wear your dress down with sleeves down to your uh, wrist. You've got to wear your dress down to your ankles, and uh, God's not honored with makeup. And uh, he went on down the list as far as the things that's required. Uh, it is, if you will, called legalism. The Pharisees were familiar with that. They had 613 rules and regulations. We'll talk about that in a moment. They had 613 rules and regulations for the Jewish people to have to follow the do's and the don'ts to be in compliance with the law of God. We find today multitudes of people across denominational lines that will strive to do all of the do's and all of the don'ts, all the rights, rituals, rules, and regulations to please God. There are those that will be busy, busy, busy being sure that they say the right words to be with the right uh, uh, crowd and to be right with the Lord. One can say all of the right words and do all of the good things and follow to the letter of the law, yet die and spend eternity in hell. Head knowledge, intellectual knowledge, philosophical knowledge, agreeing with all that the Scripture says, still doesn't save you. Salvation is a work of grace to whosoever will. It is a free gift predicated only on an individual's receiving of that free gift. There must be a total commitment of life by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. Many will hear the truth. This is something that you see in the text in a moment. Many will hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many will have a sense of urgency. They will recognize a need in that yet they will not make a commitment to say yes to Jesus as Savior. In the text that is before us, we have a brilliant man. He is a scribe. Scribes are in charge of writing out the law and the teaching of the law and the leadership in the realm of religious things. This brilliant man, a teacher of God's law, had an intellectual knowledge of God through Jesus Christ, yet he was not saved. Jesus says, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. May I remind us what we see in this text is so close, yet so far. Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the Word of God. Verse 28 and following in chapter 12, Gospel according to Mark. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, Ask him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love thy neighbor, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like unto this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. 
and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength and with all the, and to love thy neighbor as himself is more than all the, more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifice. Verse 34, and when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that dusk ask him any questions. Thank you, and we may be seated. I want us to notice three things briefly in this time that we have together in relationship to so close yet so far. Notice three things. First of all, the searching probe reviewed in verse 28. The second thing we see is the spiritual priorities recorded in verse 29 through 31. And the third thing, the serious problem revealed in verses 34, 32 through 34. Notice first of all in verse 28, the searching probe reviewed. I want us to notice the person first of all. And one of the scribes came having heard them reasoning together. You recall the Lord Jesus had had the scribes, the chief priest, the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees coming in wave after wave after wave, challenging him with questions. According to chapter 11, verse 27, 28, they'd already made a decision that they're going to find a way, they're plotting a way to trick Jesus, to trap Jesus in saying something that they can make the accusation because they've already determined we're going to get this old boy out of the way. We're going to kill Jesus. And it was done out of envy and pride because they were the religious leaders of that day. May I remind us, they had attempted to trap him with loaded questions. Now, the scripture tells us one of the scribes, it was, and I, the scripture doesn't reveal this, but picture uh, for me for a moment as you think. Here the scribes had come to him in a group, the Pharisees and the chief priests and the Sadducees and the Herodians at, on different times. And now they've selected one out of the whole group of scribes. One that's, uh, if you will, he drew the short straw. One that they decided, you are the boy that's going to confront Jesus this time. I think you're the one that can do it. And I think that they chose him because of this. One that interprets the law, and this, according to Matthew 24 and verse 34 and 35, tells us that this scribe was a lawyer. So I think they chose him because he was a lawyer. This is the person that had a head knowledge of the law of God. He had the intellectual understanding of God's law and God's word, yet uh, from a philosophical intellectual perspective and not a heart's relationship. You see, in that day, the scribes were the go-to people for anything they wanted to find out and any question they had about the law of God. They had so meticulously studied and dissected the Word of God then the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament that in the book of Moses only, just in the first five books of the Bible, we call it the Pentateuch, the book of Moses, they had already developed 613 do's and don'ts. They were lost religious leaders. You get the picture? You understand now who the man is that's coming before the Lord Jesus Christ? We see, first of all, the person. But I want you to notice the perception in verse 28. This is the scribe, the lawyer scribe that's come to Jesus, and having heard them reasoning, that is, having heard Jesus and the Herodians and the Sadducees and the chief priests and the scribes, having heard them reasoning, that is arguing, questioning, disputing together, challenging together, and perceiving that he had answered them well. Here is this scribe, uh, lawyer, uh, person, the one that knows the law of God, that's helped with the development of the 613 rules and regulations for a Jewish person to be right with God. And he comes to the Lord Jesus Christ because, if you please, he's already seen what they, what they have done before. He's heard the questions. He's heard the answers. And the scripture says, and perceiving that they, he had answered them, speaking of Jesus, had answered them well. May I remind us, this learned, educated, legal mind had listened to Jesus. He had heard his dialogue with the Sadducees. He had heard his the, the trick questions, according to verses 18 through 27. He had listened to Jesus' answers, and he was uh, sure that what Jesus said was accurate and absolutely factual. May I remind us, it was the correctness of Jesus' answers that spoke to his heart. 
It is the fact that Jesus did not beat around the bush as he dealt with them openly and honestly and directly when he gave them answers. He was impressed with Jesus' response as he heard the truth of the word of God. Remind you, this scribe lawyer had heard Jesus answering regarding the coming resurrection. He was now aware of the truth of God's word. I want you to see, woven through the text that we're looking at, that here's a man that's loose. He is a uh, likes lost liberal. Here's a man that's a learned man. Here's a man that's intellectually uh, brilliant. Here's a man that knows the letter of the law. Here's a man that's been re responsible and involved in the religious leadership of his day. And he's been made aware now of the truth of the word of God. This scribe is only a tool at the beginning, only a tool to be used by the Pharisees to trick Jesus. But a strange thing is happening in his life. He's being convicted by the truth of the word of God. He's being challenged and convicted by what Jesus Christ says to him about the scripture. And may I remind us, that's the thing that takes place, the reason it's so imperative that we as believers get to lost people, get them to be under the word as the word is proclaimed. They might reject the word. They might not like the word. They may want to challenge the word. But if they can be subjected to hearing the word, hearing the truth of the word of God, there's the open door possibility of their salvation taking place. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by dia through the word of God. Romans 10 verses 14 through 17 reminds us. Not only do we see the person and the perspective, the perception, but I want you to notice the probe in verse 28, the latter portion. Ask him, that is asking Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? Literally, the lawyer, scribe, wanted to know which of the commandments would be first. The word first there is the word protos, priority, number one. Which one would take place? Which one has greater precedence? Which one has the greater authority? Which one has the greater impact? Which one? Now, he, he was familiar with all of the commandments, and he wanted to know from Jesus, which one do you consider, Jesus, to be priority number one? And they were, keep in mind, he was asking that as a trick, trapping question for the Lord Jesus. He wants to know which one is first, which one is in rank of importance. This man is searching for an honest answer. You see, the Jewish religious leaders had divided the commandments into 613 rules and regulations and rights. And they were divided this way. They bifurcated the 613 into two places. They developed 365 negative precepts and 248 positive precepts, all of which the religious Jews were required to obey. Some things they could not do and some things they could do. In fact, under that, regimentation of the 613 rites, rituals, rules, and regulations, the do's and don'ts, a uh, Jewish Christian, a Jewish believer, a Jewish religious person was not allowed to leave his property for more than one mile on the Sabbath. You know what the Jewish person's people would do? They get go to their backyard, get a uh, handful of sand, put it in a little cloth bag, a little sack, put in their pocket. They'd walk a mile, they'd take a few grains of that sand out and put it on the ground, they'd step their right foot on it and walk another mile so they could circumvent the law. And that's the process that they had in trying to be righteous with God. They wanted to be right with God and therefore they were willing to go through the hoops and the loops of all the rites, rituals, rules and regulations of the 613 regulations and rites that were set up by the scribes and by the Jewish religious leaders of that day. They believed that all of them were important but the liberal school of thought and the conservative school of thought differed on which one was foremost differed on which one was correct, differed on which one should take precedence and priority over all of the others. Notice two things about this man. First of all, notice his curiosity and notice his confrontation. His curiosity. He had heard Jesus. He had listened to Jesus. He had heard all of the arguments. He had heard all of the questions. He had heard all of the answers from the scribes and the Pharisees and the Herodians and the Sadducees. And his curiosity regarding the truth of the gospel caused him to ask the question to Jesus. They had both moral and ethical laws about man and God. All of the laws about man and God was what he was talking about. This man is seeking truth. This man wants a correct answer. Notice not only his curiosity, but notice his confrontation. In Matthew 25, 35, says, uh, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting, that is, testing him, saying, 
That's what this man is doing. He's confronting Jesus. Like all the others, this scribe confronts Jesus with what he considered to be a tough, tough question. One that he felt could not be adequately answered from Jesus, yet he really wanted to find the truth. That's the irony of what I see in the text. He was asking a tough question. He was a tool by the uh, Pharisees and the other religious leaders. He was one of the scribes that was coming in chosen to ask the questions. He starts out simply doing what he was assigned to do to try to trip Jesus and to trick him in some fashion. May I remind us many times God will allow a lost person that's around us to ask questions. You hear what I'm saying? A lost person around us to challenge us with what we believe. A lost person around us will ask the question. Some of them are seeking truth and others are seeking to trap one that they're asking. I've had that too many times down through the years where there would be a superficial, hypothetical question and the idea behind it is, how can I find him wrong? How can we trip him up? How can some way uh, we show that he is not correct in the answer that he gives? And I've had too many times when a person, after they frantically try to challenge the Scripture, finally, as one dear lady said, I don't care what the Scripture says, I know what I believe. So there's some that will listen and adhere to what you're saying. Are you prepared to answer the biblical questions that some will have from lost people? Josh McDaniel, Josh McDow, uh, uh, McDowell was one of those people. Josh McDowell was a trained lawyer, and he set out on a task to disprove the Lord Jesus Christ and the truth of the Word of God. He wanted to disprove primarily the resurrection. That was the goal that he had. And as a result of his research and his study of the Scripture, Josh McDowell wrote a book, that's still in print today, evidence that demands a verdict. The evidence, he said, was so overwhelming in the Scripture that Jesus Christ was who he said he was, that the resurrection is what the Bible says it was. As a result of that, Josh McDowell got saved as a result of searching the Scripture to try to disprove the Word of God. May I remind us, I love that question and answer format where a person can ask a question, you have the opportunity to search the Scripture and give an answer and to respond. First of all, we see the searching probe reviewed. In verse 29 through 31, we see the spiritual priorities recorded. The spiritual priorities recorded. First of all, notice the personal confession in verse 29. And Jesus answered him, the first, that is the protos, priority of all the commandments is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Jesus, by the way, quotes the Shema that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. The opening words of the Shema, literally, the Shema is the Jewish confession. The Jews uh, uh, points this out uh, to the Lord Jesus, but they call him Yahweh, God, our Lord. And the scribes are to do that morning and afternoon, twice a day, they repent. Repeat, repeat the Shema, the great confession of faith for Jewish people. May I remind us, Jesus said, The Lord, our God, Yahweh, is one Lord. Uh, and in that one Lord, Elohim, meaning plurality, and it points, by the way, to the triunity of the Godhead in the answer that Jesus gives him. And I'm sure that as a Jewish person, he knew uh, Hebrew and he understood what Jesus was saying, though he did not fathom, I'm sure, the triunity of the Godhead. This is the confession of faith that the Jewish people repeated morning and evening. That's the confession, personal confession. But notice the personal command in verse 30 and 31. Jesus gives a twofold command to this scribe. I find it fascinating. First of all, he says... He is love for the master. First of all, he talks about his love for the master. And thou, speaking to this scribe lawyer, thou, that is you personally, shall, that is command, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first, that is the priority, pro, protos, number one, most important command of all. Jesus said the first most important thing is to love God, to love God. That word all there literally is comprehensive love. It's not some short-circuited love. It's comprehensive. The question is, do we really love the Lord God? Do we really love Him? Jesus directs this scribe lawyer that our love for the Lord is to be total, complete, comprehensive, volitional commitment of our lives unto Him completely. Notice there's about four things there, and I'll not dwell on them, but simply touch on them. Number one is with all the heart. With all thy heart. That is the seat of emotion, the control center of our lives. That's talking about our acumen and what we're made up of, if you will. 
Secondly, it's all thy soul. That is literally with all of the existence and consciousness that we have. That's our affections. And then all thy mind. That's literally understanding our capacity. It is our awareness of all that there is around us spiritually and biblically. And then all thy strength. That's talking about capability, our abilities. Jesus said that we're to love the Lord to the very ultimate in our convictions and our commitment and with our lives. Now, may I pause for a moment and ask us to analyze in our hearts. Do we really love the Lord? Or is it simply we do part-time? Is it something that we do on a $2 worth of God basis? Dr. Chuck Swindoll said a number of years ago that most uh, people simply want $2 worth of God. Just enough to salve the conscience, but not enough to bring about conviction. Multitudes of folks today fall in that category. They do not want to know the Word of God in depth. They do not want to know what God's Word says about our requirement of loving Him with all of our mind, all of our strength, all of our understanding, all of our hearts. And that's what Jesus is saying to this scribe lawyer. Jesus says we're to love the Lord to the very ultimate in our convictions and our commitments. We're to love Him completely. Not just on Easter and Christmas. Not just on Sunday, but every day. No partial commitment. His love for the master is what Jesus says is first. And secondly, his love for man. And the second is like, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is none other than a commandment. This, there is no other commandment greater than these. He says, first of all, you've got to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and spirit. Everything within us says, God, I love you. And namely, he says, this is also equal to that, is love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, the second priority stands right alongside the first, he's saying. He says, no such thing as first and second. Both of them are priority. Both of them are uh, protos, number one. And both of them are in order of importance the same. Love for the neighbor. What Jesus is doing there I find fascinating. He's quoting his own word. If Jesus Christ is God and he is, and if God's word is from God and it is, then it's from Jesus, but he's quoting Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 where the scripture says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear uh, any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Now listen very carefully. This is a what I call a linchpin that the balance of the text hangs on. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, for example, chapter 12, for example, is the uh, gifts, talents, and abilities that God's given to us sever uh, severally according to the Scripture. In chapter 13 is the love chapter that uh, is the hinge that chapter 12 and chapter 14 swings on in the 1 Corinthians text. Why did God, in his word, put chapter 13, the love chapter, in the very midst of the chapter about uh, the spiritual gifts and chapter 14, the misuse of the spiritual gifts? What were they doing at Corinth? They were misusing the spiritual gifts, and it was an indication they did not love the neighbor. And the Word of God points out to them what love is, and that love ought to be the controlling factor for what they did and they were doing with the spiritual gifts. That's the reason it's sandwiched between chapter 12 and chapter 14. We refer to it as the love chapter, and that is all right, but we, you should not take it out of context without understanding chapter 12 and chapter 14. It's the spiritual gifts and the misuse of the spiritual gifts that ought to be controlled by love. That's a door. The hinge happens to be love, and the door, one side, is chapter 12, and the other side is chapter 14. The same is true with the uh, Jewish people, the Jewish religious leaders. They were not exemplifying love for the neighbor. What they were doing was either rites, rituals, rules, and regulations. They were the hierarchy, and all the others walking on the street were just the peasants. They were, the, they were required to jump when they said jump and follow the commands based on their little 613 rules and regulations. And so that's the reason Jesus points out that you're to love your neighbor as you love yourself. May I remind us it's not possible to love the neighbor until, first of all, we love the Lord fully and completely in our hearts and in our lives. Jesus reminds the scribes uh, that this is because there are 613 do's and don'ts. There was no love for one another. It was all an act of simply phony ritualism based on the regulations and the rights that they had set up. That's R-I-T-E-S. Obedience to the Word shows our love to the Master and to the, our fellow man. In fact, in 1 John, you need not turn to it. Let me read it for our edification. 
First John, the fifth chapter, verses one and following. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him, that begat loveth him also, that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? May I remind us, in that First John text, it deals with love throughout. And if we really love God, we're going to love our neighbor. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Believers are not to live by rules and rights and regulations, but by relationship to God through Jesus Christ. May I remind us, in your leisure, look at John 15, verse 12 through 17. Look at John 13, verse 33 through 35. I'll read that briefly. Little children, yet, yet a little while, and I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another. And that's what Jesus is saying to this uh, uh, scribe as he is talking with him, this uh, lawyer, this attorney, scribe that's a learned man, but it's all out of rights, rituals, rules, and regulations. And it's a phony relationship because he's not said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. The Searching Probe Review. The spiritual priority is recorded, but I want you to notice the apex of the text in these next three verses. The serious problem revealed. That's where this whole text is going, this whole theme of uh, thought. Notice, first of all, the positive agreement, verse 32 and 33. And the scribe said unto him, Jesus, well, good, Jesus, well. It's the Lord Kellos. And it simply means to be good, to be approved, to be honorable. He says, what you've said is good, it's well, it's honorable. Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all thy heart, and with all thy understanding, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more, notice, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Notice two things. First of all, his compliment in verse 32 and his conviction in verse 33. This man compliments the Lord Jesus. This man says, if you put it in the young blood vernacular, Jesus gets there. Keep in mind, Jesus Christ is God. It's not just a matter of another religious leader that this man is talking with. And Jesus gives him the facts and the truth of his answer to his question. And this man says, in essence, wow, man, you're so right. Yes, Jesus, you're right. You're on target. Man, I like what you just said. <laughs> That's the way it would be responded to today. This lawyer, scribe, teacher of the law gets uh, the weight of the spiritual truth of what Jesus has just said. When this scribe first started his conversation with Jesus, he was only a tool of the Pharisees intending to get some something that he could find that's against Jesus. But after hearing the word of God spoken by Jesus Christ, his heart is convicted. His heart is under conviction. His heart has changed in relationship to what he's hearing and the cold, callous heart that he had when he started out. We see that in his conviction in verse 33 that I read just a moment ago. He came searching for answers out of confrontation, but Jesus' words brought deep conviction rather than confrontation. Verse 33, the latter portion again, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Literally, he said to Jesus, this is superior to all the religious rites and rituals that I've been accustomed to. This is superior to all that I've been doing and pumping the treadmill all of these years. This is superior. If you would look at it and understand the man's heart, literally saying, this is wonderful. It's grand. It's great. I did not know this before. In fact, you find in 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel confronts Saul with something very similar. 
And Samuel said, he's speaking to Saul, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and the heart and to hearken than the fat of rams. He said, listen, Saul, it's better to obey the voice of God than to offer all of the sacrifices that you've been offering and doing. This man, this scribe, lawyer, religious leader, now realizes that religious rites and rituals so accepted by so many are vacuous and void. We must serve the Lord out of love and love only. Nothing else will suffice. That's the positive agreement. He's in agreement with what Jesus is saying. But I want you to notice in that last verse what I call the penetrating answer. The penetrating answer. Verse 34 says, And when Jesus saw, now it goes a whole lot deeper than just looking at the man. When you see that and you understand Jesus Christ is God, he looked down into his heart with that penetrating look. Jesus Christ knew his heart. He knew his life. He knew his motive. He knew all that he had done. He knew all that was taking place in this man's heart, his life, and his understanding at that very moment. And the scripture says, and when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, that is literally wisely, intellectually, correctly, to be in possession of his mind is what it's saying. Discreetly means to be in possession of one's mind and thoughts and to be wise in that understanding. He said unto him, listen to what Jesus says, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And then the scripture says, and no man after that durst ask him any questions, speaking of any of the detractors ever coming back and asking Jesus questions to try to entrap him. But notice the key phrase, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. So close, yet so far. What does this mean? What is Jesus saying to this man? This is the real answer to the whole text. He is saying, you are right on verge, the verge of the kingdom. You have heard what I said. You know what I've said. You have perceived it in your heart. You have inculcated it in your heart. You've recognized it. You've verbalized it. You've committed to it. But there's one more step, and that's the step of faith of saying yes to Jesus Christ. It is amazing to me the number of people down through the years that I've talked with and I pointed out the claims of Christ upon their lives. I pointed out what the scripture said and they will agree. The Bible is true. Jesus Christ is real. God is very, very real. I believe in God. I believe that we ought to serve him. I believe that we ought to surrender our lives to him. I believe that the scripture is true. I believe that Jesus died. I believe that he was buried. I believe that he rose again. But folks, the scripture says even the demons in hell believe and tremble but they're not saved. It takes a volitional choice after perceiving and believing there must be the receiving of Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. Jesus is saying you're on the very verge of the kingdom. You know the truth. You understand God's word. You recognize God's love. You are just one step from salvation. You must accept Jesus as Savior and as Lord. You see, it's one thing to recognize the truth of God's word intellectually, but that's not enough. That's intellectual salvation. Believing with the head is not enough. I use the term, there are a lot of folks that are saved in the head and not in the heart. There are a lot of folks that have head salvation, not heart relationship. Many today will say that they believe the Bible and believe that Jesus Christ is God and all of the theological dogma that we can talk about. They believe it, but it's so close and yet so far. Let me close with an illustration. Quite a few years ago now, more than I like to count, Dr. Belden Smith was one of my New Testament professors in Bible college. He was a pastor teacher. Dr. Smith had at one time pastored up in North Carolina. And he told the story about a man and he gave the name and I've written the illustration down many years ago. Jerry Funderburk lived in North Carolina. 
He drove a laundry truck. And Dr. Smith said the only way he knew how to drive was fast. Dr. Smith received a call one afternoon late in the evening, rushed to the hospital. He went to Jerry's house then to tell his wife the tragic news that Jerry had died in a crash. He rung the doorbell. The wife came to the door. Old oh, pastor, come on in. As she invited him in, she said, I'm just getting supper ready for Jerry. He called not too long ago and said he was coming home. I'm preparing his favorite meal, turkey and dressing. As she was removing the turkey from the oven, Dr. Smith tells her what has just happened with Jerry. And she said, oh, pastor, oh, pastor, he was so close. He was so close. He was so close. Folks, there's a vast difference of being close, but yet so far off.